Thank you so much. We have uh, Dakota Cohen of Cohen Farms, who literally, I like to say, produces the best food in Alberta. Um, you're doing amazing, amazing things up there. You're using a style called regenerative agriculture. So you are literally not only producing the best food in, in the province, but you are building soil. You're improving the ecosystem as you do it. You are, you're, you're my hero. <laughs> well, thanks, Malcolm. You're you're definitely one of mine as well. I I, uh, I love the work that the Light Cellar does, and it's I'm super happy to be here. Yeah, cool. Well, we're going to dive into a conversation that um, is is going to lead us uh, to this this idea. Last time we touched base, it was kind of the beginning of the pandemic. We we're doing the community immunity series. We had an awesome interview. Loved all the insights and everything that you shared. And uh, you know, there was a few things that that really stuck out for me from that conversation. Uh, one was, uh, you know, very early on, right, with all the kind of the theories, the conspiracies, like it's aliens, it's this, it's that. You know, you had you had such a great grounded perspective of regardless, doesn't matter, sure, accept it as true, whatever it is, you know, what's the action, what are you going to do, and uh, yeah, that, that's kept me grounded, kept me sane, uh, though I have, I have, I have indulged in, in a few theories. <laughs> I have, I have too, so, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's like soap opera, basically, it's, I don't, I don't watch TV, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and ultimately, you know, I really think that, uh, you know, one does need to keep informed. And uh, so it's about, it's about that balance. That's what it's been for me. Sometimes I go off the deep end and I'm like, oh, I got to take a few days off. Um, but things have been changing so much. And, you know, really where I've, where I've landed, where I'm grounded at in now is, is, is what am I doing? How am I going to create the world that I want to live in? Uh, well aware of, of some agendas and, and some things that are, are going on. Uh, this is it. So love what you're doing. You're, you're such a major force in the world of local food production. Uh, you've been working intimately as well with Verge Permaculture. Uh, we're going to be having an interview with Rob Avis, Introduction to Permaculture. It's going to be a three-part series. And uh, folks wanted to go on from there, be a part of the, uh, the online permaculture design course that you, you're just finishing one up. You had a number of students through. Amazing. I know some of my staff are taking it and absolutely loving it. Yeah, so thanks for all you're doing, the, the positive, the uh, let's create, create, create the world we want to live in. And that absolutely is, is to me, I think the, the biggest impact uh, we can have is, is through our food choices, um, not only for our own personal health, but the health of our society. Um, yeah, so you're, you're at the front lines there. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And it's, yeah. it's also, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, way way funner like i i i say that like no one wants to join your revolution if it sucks <laughs> <laughs> so like if we're just uh you know like we're all suffering and just bitter and awful all the time like no nobody wants to be a part of that versus <laughs> like this style is like it's it's we're gonna it's gonna taste better it's gonna be fun we're gonna laugh a lot and and we're gonna create meaningful change um and uh you don't have to fight anybody we just have to just have to cook better food and, 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 and encourage other people to do the same. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I see some instruments behind you. I think that, uh, that includes part of your fun as well, doesn't it? I, uh, that's, that's my winter, uh, winter, winter project. There's, there's, there's no time in the summer. I don't, I basically, I, uh, I sleep and I eat and, and I work in the summertime. So but yeah, <laughs> in the winter when we've got long, uh, long nights, it's, it's fun to, to play a bit of music. Yeah, that's awesome. Cool. Well, so the other thing that really stuck out the last time we had a conversation was that you were you were on this path. You're like, I want to get rid of my refrigerator, and uh, you've been on this journey, you know. And and I have to say, uh, you know, I, that was that's not even on my radar, but it, it actually really did get me thinking. It's like, oh wow, he's going to go beyond his refrigerator, and it reminded me of uh, I don't know if it was you that said it, but I. I I've been quoting this anonymous person as like a friend of mine, you know, who made this comment. He, he said that not the most dangerous invention in the world is the refrigerator. Was, <laughs> was that you? Uh, I, I, uh, I, it's, it sounds like it came from me, although, <clears throat> um, yeah, I certainly didn't. The, the original idea for that came from, um, a guy named, uh, what's his name here? Um, uh, David Asher. Oh yeah, there's this great book called the the natural the art of natural cheese making, and um, the, the the idea for that came from I, I took a course from him and he, he was saying 
that when if you refrigerate raw milk, it's like slowly throwing it away. <laughs> and and like when he when he said that, I was like, oh my god, that's like that's like everything because like, and that's literally how a refrigerator works. It, it the, the, you drop the temperature and you slow down the decomposition process, and you slowly throw things away. They slowly go rotten. <laughs> and uh, and so that got me thinking. It's like, man, like what if this like you know, this amazing life-saving invention, like how does it play into a lot of the health issues that we're facing today? Um, because basically what it did is it, it um, the refrigeration allowed us to get lazy and, and to stop doing our kind of, uh, you know, ancient food preservation techniques like, you know, preservation, dehydration, fermentation. Um, and, um, and, and it's like, what are all the consequences of that? So uh, it was just a, yeah <laughs> that's the stuff that i think about <laughs> yeah yeah it's amazing no i i fully agree you know here we are we're in this this kind of modern society that at some point where you know the advent of refrigeration you know trucking you know 24 7 365 we have access to fresh foods whatever we want and uh yeah i, I think a lot of us got into this mentality of like oh, we don't need to ferment we don't need to you know preserve our food because we can get fresh any time of year and uh we're, we're waking up to that realization that whoops that that was maybe not such a good idea and uh, again coming back to that idea that the revolution should be fun it should be tasty uh that's what fermentation absolutely is i know a lot of us you know, within the Lake Southern community, we're 100% on board, you know, we're fermenting kombucha and water kefir, and we're doing sauerkraut and pickles and hot sauce. And uh, you've ventured into some new realms, which, you know, obviously being a, a meat producer, uh, fermenting meat. Now, now give us a little bit of an insight uh, into, you know, what that is, what does that look like? And I'm sure maybe some of us will be surprised that maybe we've even tasted some of those foods. Mm -hmm. Let us know. Totally. So the, um, the uh, you know, I, my kind of gateway drug into, into fermentation was, um, you know, the sauerkrauts and, you know, like the, the um, brine pickles and things like that. Um, that was, you know, quite a few years ago for me. It's and, true. So sauerkraut is, it's, it's the gateway ferment. I love yeah, it. it is. And, and then, you know, I did, I did all the kombuchas and stuff like that. And I just, I loved it. And it was like, like, like it's like a skill you know once you once you kind of get good at it it's, it's so easy and you just like it's actually um uh it, it's 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 faster than than kind of the you know the the alternatives like like refrigerating things and like you can do a whole bunch at once and you just sit on your counter and like i've i've left ferments out for like a year and like i have small jars i don't didn't refrigerate them and i just you know kept eating them throughout the whole year without refrigerating them and it's like so that that was kind of my my interest in getting into all that and also the, the nutrient dense aspect of it, and as I kind of kept going more, um, you know, I started stumbling across you know the art of fermentation, which is Sandra Katz's book, and there's also a really uh, uh, another really good book that um, uh, the founder of Permaculture, Bill Mollison, um, wrote, which is called uh, the the Permaculture Book of Ferment and Human Nutrition. And, and this is where I've, I kind of finally made the connection between like, oh yeah, like, like meat can be fermented too. And I, I just, I'd never realized that, but he's got a section in there for, you know, for all about meats. And so like, for example, like salami or prosciutto or, you know, any of the charcuterie meats, those are actually all fermented meats. Um, and then, you know, taking, I, I took a raw cheese course and um there was uh there was a fella in the ch in the cheese course who um who ran his own uh, charcuterie uh, shop in uh in edmonton and he was talking about how the the same bacteria and organisms that are used to ferment raw cheeses are the same ones that ferment meat and 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 then i made the connection it's also the same organisms that ferment vegetables you know that like white scum that you'll sometimes get on the tops of your your um your ferments um like one of those organisms called is like geotrician candidum or there's different penic penicillins and you know lactobacillus and stuff like that those are all uh they're all the same and uh it just blew my mind and then as i started to you know really get into like okay how do we how do we ferment these things like what are what's the temperature requirement what's the salt requirement they're all the same it's like 
r room temperature, 3% salt, <laughs> for, no matter what it is. And, and, uh, uh, and so I started to get, you know, really excited about this, but I, but for me, and like, and I'm sure like a lot of people, as soon as you start talking about like fermented meat, you know, like leaving a hunk of meat out at room temperature for three weeks, it's like, well, like, like, yeah, for whatever breaks. reason, it's, it's fine to do that with vegetables. It, it, like it's, I can kind of get it for cheese, but like when I started doing this with meat, I was like terrified. I was like, I'm going to kill somebody. And the first slice that I ate, <laughs> I was like, it was like nine, one. And then like I ate it <laughs> and just like sat there for like an hour. I was like, all right, I didn't die. And, uh, and then I slowly started to feed it to the rest of my family and, and nobody's died yet. Uh, and, and so now I've, I've, and I've done it enough that I'm comfortable, you know, talking about it. And it's actually, I think it's, it's probably one of the easiest things to ferment. Um, and I also think it's one of the most rewarding and one of the most delicious things to ferment as well. So basically in today's, you know, uh, talk, I'm going to go through, um, a really simple, uh, recipe that I learned from, um, uh, this guy, these two guys' books. This is kind of like the, the, the original book, um, the, the Craft of Italian Dry Curing or Salumi by Michael Ruhlman and, and Brian Paul, uh, some crazy Polish name that I can't pronounce. <laughs> but um, it's actually crazy easy. And you know, I've got some you know, various um, you know, charcuteries here. So you know, this guy here is, uh, is a little piece of uh, uh, pork cheek or uh, the jowl of a pig, or it's called the guanacali. Um, it's like, this is one of my absolute favorites. And then I've got some, you know, smoked pancetta or, or bacon that uh, I've done. And this is just, you know, regular pancetta. And, um, and all these things have been sitting out at room temperature for, for weeks. Uh, and they just keep getting better. <laughs> wow. So, uh, yeah, basically today I'm just going to kind of walk you through like the, the, a, a very simple recipe to, to, to get you started. Um, talk about some of the, um, you know, pitfalls and things you got to watch out for. And, <clears throat> and just to get you started, there's, there's a lot more complex things that you can get into um, uh, that I, I've even done myself, like, like, you know, fermenting, you know, sausages or salamis and things like that. that's, that's where actually where the, the danger comes from. And we'll, we'll talk about that. But in terms of, of whole muscle curing, which is you take like a, a, a complete slab of meat, like a, you know, a belly or a tenderloin or a, a, you know, the uh, shoulder cut off of a, of a pig or something like that. And you ferment that whole muscle by itself. It's actually very, very safe. And all you need is salt, um, a, a place in your house that's dark. Um, and it is between you know, 12 to 18 degrees Celsius. Uh, and that has decent air circulation and ideally it's like 70% humidity, but, um, the, I've actually experimented with, with, uh, like a, a room in my basement where it was 30% humidity is very, very dry and it still works great. And I'll talk about kind of a hack for how you can, if you don't have a 70% humidity, what you can do to, to get around that. And that's it. It's wow. like, it's super easy. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, Go ahead, Malcolm. Yeah. So, and maybe maybe before you start, I mean, there's two things I want to kind of preface here. So, you you establish like how easy it is, right? It's easier than throwing stuff in your refrigerator, um, and you know, not only are you avoiding that kind of slow decay of throwing away, you're actually at least at least I know from fermenting vegetables, fermenting you know grains, uh, beans, you know, definitely dairy, things like this as well, which I'm very well versed in, uh, you're actually enhancing the nutritional, uh, not only, um, you know, content, but also the, the bioavailability, the ability for your body to digest that, assimilate that, that go, all goes up, and then flavor as well is, is just, all of it's off the charts, so, so why wouldn't we? And yeah. the other thing that I want to preface is that, um, you know, again, I, I've mentioned, I sing Dakota's praises in terms of, um, you know, the quality of food that he produces all the way from, from, from the berries to the meat that he raises. Uh, your pork, uh, I know you've had it tested where, you know, you're, 
not only are you, you caring for them in, in such a wonderful way, you're, you're feeding them an, a nutrient dense diet, again, in a way that's increasing uh, the kind of the, the richness, the biodiversity of the land. Uh, but you've had your pork tested and it's actually got, you said, is, was it as high or higher in omega threes than uh, fish? So the, <clears throat> um, the, uh, it, it, it wasn't necessarily higher than, than, um, than fish. But it, it had omega threes um, and I think omega sixes that are typically only found in seafood. Oh, that's what it was. Yeah. Kinds and so, but our our pork had I think it was like five times five times the omega threes that you know factory farm pork does. But then the, the interesting thing was that yeah, like our our pork has has omega fatty acids that are typically only found in seafood, which is which is really funny because for years, particularly with our our bacon. Um, the, one of the comments I, I've heard several times is like, when you cook it, it smells a little bit like, like fish. It's like, just like a, a slight, when you eat it, there's no taste, but the, the, the smells of as it's cooking. And I couldn't figure it out. And, but then when we got the, our test results back, I just, like everything kind of clicked for me. And one of the reasons why I think we have those, those, um, uh, you know, omega fatty acids that are typically found in seafood is one of the things we feed our pigs is an aquatic plant called duckweed. Uh, or lemna minor, as well as all the raw milk and the fermented vegetable, uh, fermented grains and things like that. But um, for a couple of years now, we've been we've been supplementing their diet with this. This it's a it's a native plant that's super high in protein. It's very easy to to digest, and very very you know rich in nutrients. And it was just it it was a incredible experience for us to to see like wow like it actually does not only do can we, can we taste it and kind of solve that mystery, but you can actually measure it. And uh, um, so th this is, this is what, what we're all about on our, our, our farm is, is, you know, trying to, um, trying to find ways that we can, we can heal, you know, people and the planet and in, in the, just through, through nutrient dense food. Yeah, that's awesome. And another thing that you already demonstrated is is using you know the whole animal in, in obviously in complete honor and respect for the animal, uh, but also knowing that every single part it, it's whole food nutrition. You know, so you're talking about using the the cheek, you know, using the the back shoulder, all these different parts um, that you know more often than not, unfortunately, uh, goes to waste. But so thanks for being an example of that. Yeah. So the, um, before I dive into how, how this all works and, and, um, and how to do it, which is super simple, I, I do want to um, just kind of expand on some of the things Malcolm just said there, but there's basically five reasons, um, at least that, that I've, I can think of for why you would want to start to cure your own meats or ferment your own meats um, or create your own charcuterie. Um, the, the first kind of three reasons um, are, uh, they're kind of my high level principles for, um, for what a healthy diet is, which is uh, nutrient density, nutrient diversity, and nutrient duration. Um, so uh, basically the nutrients, things like vitamins, minerals, um, you know, amino acids, all those different things, those are the building blocks of, of our, our bodies. They help us you know, create hormones. Every every uh, activity that happens in our body requires nutrients. Um, and, uh, and so it's important for us to, to you know, the Sally Fallon, uh, one of the founders of the Weston A. Price Foundation, she uses this analogy that, that um, our vitamins and minerals are like the bricks and mortar of our bodies. So the, the, the minerals are like the bricks and the vitamins are like the glue or the, the sticky stuff that kind of holds everything together. Um, and, um, uh, and then the enzymes, uh, which comes from things like fermented foods, they're like the power tools that, that help us to build more efficiently, faster. Uh, and so the, the, the reason why, you know, fermented meats is so important here is, is as you said, um, uh, um, they, w w when you ferment any food, it, it becomes more bioavailable. Um, and, uh, but also coming back to the Weston A. Price Foundation, uh, which for folks don't, who don't, aren't familiar with that, you can maybe, uh, go back and check out some of, uh, um, I think I talked about it in the last chat. Uh, but I've, I've also, I have a, um, 
I've got a, a recipe book that you can download on uh, our, our website for free. And I've got all the 11 principles in there, or you can go on the Weston A. Price uh, Foundation website and check it out there. But essentially there's this dentist in the, the 1930s who traveled the world. Uh, he looked at, uh, I believe it was um, 14 different tribes on every inhabited continent. And he studied what, how these people were eating and he developed principles based on what, how they're eating. As, so as opposed to focusing on uh, the specifics and giving prescriptive diets, which almost every other diet you come across is, it's like, eat this specific thing and this specific thing and don't eat this specific thing. This is, to my knowledge, the only kind of pattern-based um, diet or principle-based diet. And um, there's, so he came, up, he came up with basically 11 of these principles and <clears throat> the, um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but the ones that, that apply directly to why it's important for us to eat, you know, f fermented meats is um, the, the first thing is that every single culture ate meat that he, that he studied. Um, the, um, uh, every single culture ate some of their foods, uh, their animal foods raw. So they, they all eat meat and they all ate at least some of it raw. There were certain foods that were raw or that weren't cooked. <clears throat> the other one is that, is that all of these indigenous um, cultures um, had uh, very uh, high content of, of food enzymes in their diet. So things like, you know, basically fermented foods, you know, beers, um, uh, you know, fermented vegetables, fermented meats, things like that. And, uh, uh, and then the last one is that they, uh, all of these diets had um, uh, consumed some kind of salt in their diet. And so, and, and the other, you know, um, uh, the, I guess that there's, there's 11 of them as well that, that are super interesting, but those in particular, relate directly to fermented meats because it allows us to eat meat that's raw. Um, uh, and, um, oh, actually the, the, um, the, the, another principle that it's not, not perfectly related to is that uh, most cultures, uh, they, they preferentially ate organ meats over muscle meats. So that this, this, uh, really fetish of you know eating these like 24 ounce steaks is a new phenomenon and none of these in these indigenous cultures would would do that whenever if they if they harvested an animal the the muscle meats that had very little fat on them that was dog food they hardly ever ate that they would focus on the fatty cuts and um and uh or the the organ meats and so <clears throat> with, with charcuterie you are you're eating raw meat in small amounts because these are these are the muscle meats that we're curing they're they're salted and it's fermented so it's like you get all of these these principles all in one in one place um and then coming back to, you know so that, that's like the nutrient density piece as well as the nutrient nutrient diversity because as you're fermenting it you're making you're actually creating new kinds of proteins um that uh the you know the the bacteria are are dissolving it and, and that's what gives it the, that really different flavor um and then the, the nutrient duration piece is um, like, I, I personally believe that intermittent fasting is a, uh, a critical part of, of any healthy diet. It's, it's, a, it's not uh, what you eat, it's kind of when you eat and how much you eat. And, and so one of the things that I've really enjoyed about, um, you know, charcuterie and stuff like that is uh, I found that when I started eating, you know, these fermented meats and things like that, one, I stopped eating as much meat. Like I used to crave, you know, like even though I, I knew I, I shouldn't eat, you know, the, the big steaks, um, I still craved it. And, um, um, and, and it, was, it was, I had to eat a lot of meat before I, I felt satiated. Um, versus now I can eat, you know, a few slivers of this stuff and I'm satiated. Like it just, you, you so you don't need as much of it. Uh, which which ties into the you know the nutrient durations you don't you don't need to eat as much food and the food that you do eat lasts longer um, there's another great you know anecdote from um, that uh, um, Dr. Weston A. Price found when uh, he was studying the um, Inuit culture in uh, in the far north which was that the um, the, the Inuit folks who um, uh, they had you know dog sleds 
and they they always fermented the the fish that they fed to their dogs because they noticed that when they, they they fed their dogs fish that wasn't fermented their dogs couldn't pull their sleighs as long mm. and uh and i've basically noticed the same thing for myself is like when i eat fermented foods i can work longer without getting hungry and and i don't need as much meat um which means i'm not gonna you know be <clears throat> Um, you know, getting way too much protein in my, in my system. It's just it, all the stuff kind of really, really ties together. So the, the nutrient density, the nutrient diversity, the nutrient duration, it all fits together. And then the last two are um, food security and ethics. So uh, food security is, you kind of started off the call about this, about the idea that, you know, the, the refrigerator is you know, probably one of the most dangerous inventions um, that we've ever come up with. And you know, one of them is that it, it it basically creates a lazy food culture that allows us to um, to eat, you know, poor quality foods that are basically at various stages of of, of rotten. Um, but the other thing is that it we've lost our skills that allow us to preserve food without electricity. So you know, there's you know common uh, metrics that are thrown out there is like you know the average supermarket only has three days worth of food in it uh, without you know constant supply um from trucks and uh and most people's houses probably have about the same it's whatever can fit in your refrigerator right um and because you know you don't have a lot of room and and, and refrigerators are expensive you know they they cost you know probably you know 10 bucks a month just in power just to run and they're you know thousands of dollars and and so um for me that this the being able to ferment you know not only vegetables and 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 dairy uh, but also meat is like, if you can, if you can do that and, and all you need is salt and you can keep them at room temperature for almost indefinitely, uh, that's a, uh, a huge level of, of food security because if, if there's ever a power outage or uh, any kind of a food shortage or anything like that, you're set and you at least know, you know, know what to do. And it's, I know that's, that's, you know, super extreme, but I think <laughs> given the, what's happened in the last couple months here, um, like, high civilizations have collapsed in the past. Oh, okay. uh, there's, yeah. there's, a, there's a great book by Jared Diamond called Collapse. And if folks are, they oh, it could never happen to us. You know, well, the, the Aztecs and the Greenland Norse and the, um, the Anasazi, they, they said the same things. Some other cultures lasted for thousands of years and they had architecture that was more advanced than ours. And in a couple decades, they, they, they were gone. So yeah. like we're, oh, yeah. we're we're not immune we're not immune to this and I don't want to be a a, a fear mongering like that I'm I'm not particularly worried about this I think we can we can totally pull out of it but um, I think uh, it's it's a great skill to have and and there's there's no downside to doing that this could literally save your life knowing how to ferment vegetables um, and and meats and dairy foods could literally save your life and uh, and that's like the, the worst case scenario. The best case scenario is you just get to eat amazing food and show off to your friends when they come over and say, like, oh, do you want to have some charcuterie I made? It's like, <laughs> uh, and then so the last piece is ethics, which is, again, Malcolm touched on this a little bit, which the, the idea that um, when, we, when we take an animal's life or a plant's life, we should, we should honor that. And, and one of the ways we can do that is by not wasting it, using as much of it as we possibly can. Um, and, and so, you know, like the, the pork cheeks or um, the, uh, or using the intestines. I, I've recently, uh, one of the pigs we butchered in our farm, I saved all the intestines. I cleaned them out and I made sausages out of them because I, I wanted to see, you know, what it was like as opposed to just buying sausage casing from the stores. And uh, it's actually very easy as well. It's, it's not complicated, but we've lost all these skills. And uh, I think that the, so all these things kind of come come together around um, uh, around charcuterie and fermented meats, and uh, I just think it's it's a, a fantastic skill to to learn. And and what you'll find as I go into how how this works uh, is that you if you've done any other fermentation, you're you're like ninety percent of the way there. And and this is way easier than I I have yet to have um, something go bad like like versus like it took me five years before i could make like a good batch of sauerkraut <laughs> uh because there's like so many you know different things that can go wrong uh the music i just got it right away yeah so 
Um, yeah, yeah, is there anything you wanted to, to add there before we dive into how it all works and how to do it? That's awesome. I love all those five reasons. That is very thorough, very detailed, and, and, and inspirational, and I'm 100% on board with, with all of those. Uh, I, I kind of did want to jump in a little bit around the kind of you know, civilization collapse, like what we've seen of 2020, uh, you know, all the way starting with the pandemic and realizing, you know, supply chains, how kind of fragile they are, and then, then the riots, like out of nowhere. And, you know, things are, I believe they're, they're just going to keep getting more turbulent. We're heading into a, you know, an election south of the border that, that seems to be heating up and getting pretty fierce. Um, you know, there's so many, there's over 40 million people unemployed uh, in the U.S. The, the pandemic, the fear still kind of hangs there. Uh, there's already been all kinds of foreshadowing of food shortages around the world. Most uh, Americans live, you know, week to week, paycheck to paycheck. Um, a lot of them are on food stamps right now. You know, we're, we're heading into the growing season let's let's hope you know like that that you know continues and provides abundance but it's very possible that uh, there's going to be some shortages so this kind of a thing I'm, I'm 100% into is is how can we build the skills how can we build this resiliency we're going to have fun doing it we're going to taste some good food we're going to increase our health so why wouldn't we you know this idea that and grocery stores and even our own homes like three days that's it right i think a lot of people experienced you know the massive lineups around the block just to get into costco you know before even all that hit you know laura and i we live a lifestyle that, that, that is like this and we, we did a lot of bulk ordering before that and then we, we even decided to get things like our staples you know just and and we barely had to go to the grocery store um and it and it feels good right it's like oh i don't need to worry about like the whole mask situation like you know we're, <laughs> oh, yeah. we're just totally. avoiding all that totally and and like so like the like for me the i i think i, I said this in the last call as well but i've been telling everybody it's like probably one of the best investments you can buy right now um is like is salt like the the forget about toilet paper like you you can you can find something else if you don't have salt um like you will literally you will literally die if your body doesn't have enough salt in it your body starts to decompose on the inside um the weston a price foundation recommends i think it's one and a half tablespoons per day for an adult um and and, and anything less than that is like your your toast and so like and it's cheap like you can buy you know 50 pounds of salt for like 10 bucks yeah, and that amount of salt would would you know last you you know at least I, I've I have one that I've probably probably a year or more, and and I'm making like a lot of fermented um, fermented foods and 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 even doing it you know for for other people in my family so. Yeah, it's so foundational. And again, when we look at, you know, previous cultures, people around the world, that, that idea of the salary actually comes from labor is being paid, paid in salt. It's, oh, yeah. it is. it's so valuable. The, the, like, that, that's the term um, salary, actually, yeah, like you said, it's the root word of it, um, the etymology of it comes from salt. Roman soldier, soldiers used to be paid in, in salt, which is actually um, where the, the, the original name's um, uh, salami came from. It, ha it shares that, that root, the, the salary or, or the salt, which is the, the Latin word for that. Um, so it, it is, <clears throat> um, or, or, you know, again, kind of going on the history of salt, one of the, um, one of Gandhi's um, kind of, I think it was, it was one of the, the kind of breaking points for him when he started to, to um, you know, revolt against the um, uh, occupa occupation of, of, of Britain and India was there was a salt tax, I believe. And, um, and people were just like, that was it. You, know, like, you, can, <laughs> you can beat us, you can be racist, you take our salt, you're done. <laughs> and and there's, they had this, I think he walked like across India to the ocean to, to break the, the rule around because um, they weren't allowed to harvest salt or something. And he was arrested for that, and that was one of the the protests that he did. So it is, this is a, um, uh, it's it's a it's a big issue, and um, and it's like that's the worst case scenario. The best case scenario, as we said, is like you just you eat better food, um, you 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 have a, a really you know meaningful hobby, and um, <clears throat> but and the other thing I don't know, which not sure where this fits in, but it's like it's it's cheaper, like to uh, you can cut your meat consumption in half easily. Your meat's probably one of the most expensive things that people are eating and, and you won't miss anything. So 
uh, even if you're just cheap, <laughs> uh, that's probably a big one. Is I mean, the sixth reason if you're cheap, you should do this. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's let's dive into kind of how how this works, and um, I'll give you know kind of a uh, like a bit of a case study about how how I do it and and things like that. So <clears throat> essentially, the um, the the curing process. Uh, or the fermentation process or whatever you want to call it is uh, there's three things that are happening. There's osmosis, there's dehydration, and there's fermentation. Uh, and so that's really the, the unique part of, of um, uh, charcuterie is, is, you know, fermentation is the same as kind of everything else that, that, that we're talking about, but the, <clears throat> the osmosis and dehydration is, is what makes the charcuterie unique. So basically, what what why the salt is important <clears throat> in this? So as you're as you're covering you know your meat with salt, um, the the cell walls uh, inside the the meat, um, you know osmosis is the movement from a high concentration to a low concentration. So basically, what will happen is the 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 salt pulls water out of the cell walls of the meat, and the salt moves into the cell walls, um, and <clears throat> and the whenever you have less water uh the basically the, the decomposition process slows down you know the, the bacteria aren't as aren't as active which is the same thing that's happening with dehydration except the de dehydration you're actually getting the moisture out of the meat um and it's it's not in the meat anymore versus the osmosis it's just it's coming out of the cell walls it's still kind of in in between the cells and then the dehydration which is after you cure the meat you let it hang in a you know a, a cool dry place for you know a couple of weeks. It slowly dehydrates out until it's about uh, approximately thirty percent of its original weight. And at that point, you have charcuterie. And then the fermentation process is while all that's happening, um, the 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 salt, you know, again same thing with fermentation. It stops the bad guys. It creates a condition for the good guys, which is slightly acidic. Um, so it allows, you know, the, the lactobacillus bacteria and, and all those good guys to, to, to go to town and they basically eat, you know, parts of the, the, the meat and their, their byproducts, which is lactic acid, help to, to ferment the meat and, and give it that, that extra flavor and, and also uh, act as a, as a preservation um, uh, part of the meat. So osmosis, dehydration, fermentation. And, and if you want to, if you want to get uh, a little bit, you know, take it to the next level, you can get into, you know, smoking your meat, which is something also, also that I've, I've been interested in. It's, it's also really easy, um, but I'm not going to talk about that today because that requires, you know, the investment in some pretty major, uh, or at least a couple hundred dollars of this stuff. The reason why I, I like this is it, I guarantee everybody has everything that you need to do this in your house already. Um, so, Basically, all you need to do is, you know, grab um, a whole cut of meat. And the reason why it needs to be a whole cut is the, the, the main danger with fermenting meats is botulism. Uh, and botulism is actually, it stems from the Latin word for sausage. And that kind of gives you a clue for, for why... Um, where it comes from, which is it's it's from the the you know the salamis. Whenever you grind meat up, you increase the surface area, um, and also you you know you're you're so you're you there's a higher chance that you're introducing stuff inside um, the in, in inside the meat, and then you're putting it in you know an intestine which came from an animal, and so there's just there's a lot more chances for contamination. But also inside that casing, it's anaerobic. And so you've got like the perfect conditions for botulism to thrive, which is, you know, a warm um, uh, uh, anaerobic uh, situation. <clears throat> and so the, that's why uh, nitrates are used because nitrates kill botulism or they, they, they make it um, inactive. Um, and so <clears throat> uh, when, if, depending on whose books you, you read, and this is why it was really confusing for me as I was trying to get started is, I didn't wanna have to use nitrates um, to do any of this curing. And I have, I actually, I have no problem with, with nitrates. Um, my problem with them is, is 
I literally cannot buy nitrates that don't have something else in them. I haven't been able to source it. Most of these sausage cure mix are filled with MSG, dextrose, cult, you know, food, red dye number two. Yeah, it's um, the, the, the pink salt, right? Yeah, the, yeah, the pink salt. It's, it's um, so the, I, I literally looked for months to try to find um, just pure nitrate and nitrite. And there's, there's, they, they both do different things. One is for like uh, really quick cures and others is for like longer cures, like basically salami or whole muscle cures. Um, and a everywhere I looked, uh, sh I short of like going to like a chemistry supply store and buying like pure nitrate, which th then it's super complicated. And so anyways, I, I, the reason I've stayed away from fermenting, um, sausages and things like that is because, um, if you just stick to whole muscles, you don't need the nitrates. Right. Uh, and, and the nitrates, so all you need is salt. So and, what have, um, have you ever seen on the, on, you know, packages, like oftentimes they'll say, you know, like nitrates from, you know, celery or whatever. Yeah. yeah so the, this is, um, uh, one of the reasons why I don't have a problem with, with nitrates and nitrates. And, and this is, I'm not sure where, you know, the fear mongering for, for, uh, this came from, but we've been using as, as humans, nitrates and nit nitrates for, for at least 2000 years. There's evidence of, of the Greeks and the Romans using it to ferment sausages and things like that. Um, and it, it's the, what, mo what people don't, uh, realize where it comes from is, uh, actually from, uh, manure from animals. Oh, really? Okay. So the, the, the traditional name for it was saltpeter. And the supposedly the like the first I, I, I'd, I'd love to be there like with like the first time somebody did this because the, the basic story goes somebody walked into a bat cave where these bats had been you know dropping their their manure for years and um, and it, the manure had leached out and it formed these crystals um, and somebody thought hey that would be awesome if I if I mix that in with some meat inside of an intestine of a pig and let it hang at room temperature for three weeks. <laughs> like, I don't know how they put that together, but th that was the original um, source for nitrates. Um, and, and that's what gives meat that nice pink color. It, it actually changes the hemoglobin in the meat um, and it stops, um, like it stops oxidation or, um, but it, so it's, it's um, the nitrate is, is a different process in the, the fermentation, but essentially it was, it was started as a way to stop botulism um, and, uh, and everything else is kind of ter it's a tertiary effect in that it, it, it gives it a kind of a unique flavor and, and also gives it that nice red color that we're familiar with our ham and our bacon. Um, but um, so to keep things simple for me until I can find a, a decent source of nitrates uh, or nitrite, um, I've just been sticking with the whole muscle cures it's also way easier. Like you don't need any sausage stuffing equipment or anything else or the casings. So you basically just go out, grab a slab of meat. Um, the, probably the easiest things to start with is like a slab of, of bacon um, or like a tenderloin, or um, you could do uh, like a, a round roast of beef. Um, you, you can cure any, any meat, but you know, pork is probably the, um, I, I would start with pork just because it, it, um, it's, it's more readily available and uh, in terms of like the, the, the whole cuts of meats and the beef has, um, I really like it, but it has a different um, flavor that's uh, a lot stronger. And so, you know, traditionally pork was the, you know, one of the only meats that was, was fermented like this. And this actually gets into the, uh, another aspect of, of why uh, fermentation is so important is there's actually a lot of research that shows that eating pork isn't good for you. Uh, so they've done like live blood analysis uh, that shows, you know, after you eat pork, uh, it's the proteins are very difficult to digest. And so one of the, like all traditional cultures that ate pork, like, you know, like the Chinese or, um, uh, you know, the Indonesian um, cultures where pork was like the, prime, the, the main source of protein in their diets, um, they only ate pork if it was marinated or, or kind of brined or fermented first, so like vinegar or with, you know, uh, pineapple or something mixed into it uh, or the cured meats. Is it, and the fermentation process breaks down the proteins a little bit, so it's easier to digest. So the Weston I. Price Foundation actually doesn't recommend eating pork 
unless it's been brined uh, in, in vinegar or, or salt or something overnight. Um, and, um, and so that, that's kind of where I, a lot of this stuff started is pe people just noticed, hey, you know, when we, when we eat raw or uh, regular pork without, that's just been cooked, we feel sluggish afterwards. It's harder to digest where versus when it's, it's been fermented, we feel better. Uh, and so that's, that's where it, it started with. So um, grab yourself like a whole, whole cut of meat. Um, I, I'd recommend starting out with something a bit smaller, like, you know, pork tenderloin is only a couple inches across or, you know, a slab of bacon is only, you know, a couple inches thick because the, the thickness of it is going to uh, uh, dictate how long it takes for it to dehydrate. So like prosciutto or like a leg of, of ham can take two years. Right. Wow. It's, it's like a 50 pound piece of meat. And so like, you don't want to, you don't want to wait two years to realize, oh, I should have put more salt in that. <laughs> right. Or, or that was amazing, but yeah. you know, like lost two years of, of time. You could have been doing more. Totally. Yeah. So, um, like start with, with smaller, thinner cuts and then work your way up from there. So like tenderloin and bacon are, are, are really good places to, um, uh, to start, but you could also do it with with a pork chop or or a pork roast or something like that. But again, yeah. the, the the bigger it is, the longer it's going to take for it to to dehydrate. So one that I did. Um, so I've only right. only ever done this uh, one type of meat, anyways. I've been done it numerous times, which is duck breast, and it oh, works, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It works, works beautifully. That's yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. skilled in that. Yeah, totally. That I I that would be delicious. Oh yeah. <clears throat> um, so the, and, uh, as, uh, just to iterate again, you can do this with any kind of meat. Um, you can do it with lamb and, and beef and things like that, but the, the, their fat is a bit different. It's is, um, a higher melting point. And so it, it kind of has a, a funny mouth feel. Um, and so it, it just might not be as uh, enjoyable. It's more of an acquired taste. Whereas if you, if you stick with, you know, kind of the, the classics, um, it's, you know, guaranteed that you're gonna, you're gonna love it. Uh, so yeah, if, if, you know, find some kind of a, a whole muscle meat that you can, you can work with. If you've got stuff in your freezer, you can do it with frozen stuff. It's, it's totally fine. If not, you can go to a butcher and, you know, grab a whole, whole slab of meat. Um, and, uh, yeah, just, um, from there, what you want to do is, uh, grab some, some fine salt. So, you know, I use, you know, just pink Himalayan salt. You can get, you know, Redmond salt, sea salt. It doesn't really matter. Uh, don't get the, um, don't get the like iodized salt or the industrial salts because they've been, they've been stripped of their minerals and a lot of them actually have added sugar in them and um, a lot of other stuff that's, that's not good. Um, so get a, a good, good quality natural salt. That's fine. Uh, you don't want the, the coarse stuff. And... <clears throat> With that, um, this is why I love this this method in this book. Um, is uh, he he has something called this the salt box method, which is essentially regardless of how big the piece of meat that you have is, um, whether it's you know one pound or ten pounds, um, the the process is you just you know put salt and whatever spices you're going to use, but you can just use plain salt as well. Um, you, you put it in a pan or a box and you just dip your meat in it until it's completely covered until no other salt salt will stick to it. So you rub it in on all surfaces, get it really packed in there. And at the point where you just, if nothing else will stick, you know, you just kind of shake it off. And um, by some miracle of math, <laughs> it basically will always work out to 3% salt. Uh, which is which is your your the target that you're going for. So you can get a scale and measure all this stuff out. Which if you're doing salami and stuff like that, you have to you have to measure it because it's like if not you'll you'll die. But with these whole muscle cures, um, there's there's just um, there's not the risk of the botulism and and uh, everything else like that because it's not anaerobic. Um, and so from there, you um, you you get the the meat totally covered in salt. Um, and then you can, you know, throw it in some kind of a, a plastic bag or a container and just put it in your fridge. And the, the metric is you want to do one day per one kilogram. Uh, so, or, or one day per two pounds is the, is the you know, the, the rough estimate. Um, or uh, another one is at least one day per inch. 
uh, of, of meat that you have to soak through. And, but that's the minimum. I actually would recommend doing it, you know, longer than that. Like, like if you're only doing a pound of bacon, you know, you can leave it in for five or six days. It's, it's, it's going to be fine, but at least one day per kilogram. Um, and the, you also want to flip it halfway through. It's called overhauling just to make sure that the salt is gets pulled in and, and the osmosis has the, uh, the salt has, has the opportunity to pull the, the water out of those cell walls. <clears throat> okay. Once you've done that, you take it out of your fridge and you wash it off. And this is, this is important because otherwise it'll be inedible because it'll be too salty. Um, so once the salt has, has been pulled into the, you know, every part of the meat, um, literally wash it on, in your sink um, and, and get all the salt off of it. Um, the first time I didn't do this because it's like, ah, oh, it's going to be dangerous. And it's like, it's way too salty. <laughs> Trust me, you'll, uh, uh, you don't need to, you don't need to worry about that. And <clears throat> I would actually recommend cutting off a little slab of, of the meat um, and eating it raw um, just to make sure it's not too salty. Because if, if it is still too salty after you've washed it off, you can let it sit in like a, 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 a cold water bath for you know, half an hour. And that will lower the salt content a little bit. And then you can taste it again to make, make sure that it's not too, too salty. Um, but for me, I've, I've never had to do that. Um, I haven't had to do that yet. I just, um, you just rub salt all over the meat, leave it in one day per kilogram in your fridge, pull it out, wash it off. And then from there, you just hang it in a dry place. Uh, that's between 12 to 18 degrees Celsius. And so, one of the things that I, I do recommend folks get is um, the, you can get these little, the brand is called ThermPro uh, and they're, they're high, low uh, temperature and humidistats. So they, um, they record the humidity and temperature, but the highest humidity and the lowest humidity, as well as the actual humidity for 24 hours, as well as all time. And they're like 20 bucks. Um, and uh, I actually bought like a, a whole, like a, I don't know, six of them or something. Cause I have them in my root cellars and like, I just put them all around my house to figure out, okay, where's, where's a location in my house that has the right temperature and, and a decent humidity. And, um, and now that I found it, that's, that's where I set up my, my stuff. So typically it's going to be like in a basement um, and you want it to be dark place because the UV light causes rancidity. So if the fat starts to go yellow, um, that it'll have a nasty taste to it. It's okay. You can just cut that yellow stuff off and it'll still be fine underneath. But the, the, if you keep it dark, it's a uh, less chance of that happening. And uh, so 12 degrees Celsius to 18 degrees Celsius. And, uh, and the goal is, is 70% humidity, but that can be really challenging in our environments uh, in, in Alberta here because it's so dry and, um, and so, you know, what a lot of the guys recommend is you like, you buy an old refrigerator and you gut it and you put like a, a humidifier in there on a hundred dollar controller. And it's really, uh, you know, it takes, it could take a lot of time and skill to get that started. Um, so what, what I do did to just see if I could try it is just hang it in a, if it's 30% humidity or 50% humidity, doesn't matter. Just hang it in a cool, the cool, dark place. and um, uh, and if it does get too dry, uh, like after two or three weeks, once, once it's lost about 30% of its weight, uh, or it, eventually you start to be able to feel um, like you, you squeeze it and it has like a, um, uh, like a, a different feel to it than when you first put it in there. Um, but once it loses 30% of its weight, it'll keep at, at room temperature for months. Um, and so, but, but if, if you do have like some, some crusty bits where it's a bit hard, that's where what, what I do is I've got a, a container. This is what I use for my, to make my, uh, my raw cheeses and stuff. And I actually keep this in my fridge uh, with the lid cracked. Um, and uh, and I, I've got a little thermometer in there as well. And you can rehumidify the, the stuff. So like I've done tenderloin where, you know, it was so hard you could barely cut it. And you just throw it into... Um, uh, one of these boxes with, with a dish of salt water or um, some cheese or something else that has moisture in it that, that is at 70% humidity and the meat will kind of rehumidify and get to that perfect uh, consistency and, 
And that's kind of how I kind of work my way around that as opposed to, you know, building my, my own meat chamber, um, which would have cost, you know, hundreds of dollars. Uh, this is just a really simple hack. And, uh, and that'll make, let, let it work basically anywhere uh, in the world. So the, um, I think that's, that's basically it. And then from there, you just, you cut it. Uh, actually, the, or the most important thing you need is a really sharp knife. <laughs> uh, because if like with the charcuterie stuff, if you're cutting off like half inch slabs, it's not enjoyable. Like it's like, it's too much salty. It's too hard to chew. It needs to be like paper thin. Um, and so if, if you don't have a sharp knife, you should, um, figure that's another skill that you should, you should learn how to do. Uh, maybe that's another call that we can do sometime. I'll go through my, <laughs> how to sharpen, uh, sharpen hand tools, but, uh, you cut it super thin and you can keep it in your fridge. It'll last longer, or you can keep it at room temperature, uh, for, you know, weeks or months and you just slowly work away at it. Uh, and there you go. It's, it's, uh. It's just that easy. Yeah, that's that's great. It, it really is easy. And like I say, I've I've done duck breast, but uh, yeah. you now you got my wheels turning. I'm like, <laughs> no, I am downstairs that uh, I can actually put this put this to a test because typically I, I do the duck breast like kind of once a year, you know, for, yeah. kind of around Christmas time and to share it with staff and you know in that, those festive occasions. But uh, yeah, you you've definitely got me on track now for for doing more and doing it more often. And it really is that easy. So I'm inspired. I'm confident, uh, and I'm I'm ready to get started. So. So really want to thank you for your time. I know, uh, yeah, it was, it was a very thorough conversation. Appreciate it. Uh, everything that you've shared all the way from those, those five, no, it was six reasons we should all be fermenting meat at home. And uh, yeah, really, really appreciate you Dakota and uh, everything you've, you've offered us here uh, this morning. So if anybody watching, you got any comments, you got any questions, you can absolutely just post those down below and uh, we'll, you know, either myself, uh, if it's on Facebook, I'll get those answered uh, on uh, YouTube. I will as well. But if, if, if I can answer it, I know Dakota is on YouTube. Uh, uh, let folks know really quickly how they can uh, be in contact with you, how they can learn more from you. I know you mentioned uh, there's a free recipe book that they can get from your website. And then you've got lots of resources online uh, through YouTube as well, not only for, you know, the human nutrition, but, you know, if anybody's kind of a farmer or an aspiring farmer, there's so much to learn from Dakota and you've got lots of resources. For sure. So the, the best place is to, is to go to our website. It's just coenfarm.ca, C-O-E-N-F-A-R-M. And yeah, we've got uh, coenfarm.ca slash resources is kind of my blog where I put, you know, any videos or articles or um, uh, anything kind of, of uh, you know, educational content that, uh, that we've got out there. And uh, if you do go to the website, there's, there's a, a, a pop-up that'll come up that if you sign up to our newsletter, you can get a free download for uh, our recipe book that has... Uh, I think it's about 15 uh, different recipes about how to uh, how to start incorporating organs, bones, and fats back into your your life, um, and uh, yeah, it's just a, a a simple place to to start. And and all all of those things also tie into the you know the, the nutrient density, diversity, and duration, uh, duration, food security, and ethics is um, uh, the organs, bones, and fats were foods that have been you know, really politicized and um, from our culture. And I think it's, it's time that we take our, our, our food sovereignty back and uh, yeah, it's, it's delicious. It's, uh, it's way easier than you think it is. It helps save you money uh, and it's just fun. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thanks again. I know you got a busy day ahead of you on the farm. So really appreciate you spending some time. Always love chatting and connecting and uh, look forward to the next time. Likewise. Okay. Thanks a lot. Take care, Malcolm. See ya.